Chelsea, you know my love of telling you about all the shitty waterways out there and what's happening to our water. This is from the High Country News posted on December 13th, 2022, written by Emily Schwing. And the article is titled, Alaska's Arctic Waterways Are Turning Orange, Threatening Drinking Water. Dozens of once crystal clear streams and rivers in the Arctic Alaska are now running bright orange and cloudy. In some cases, they may be becoming more acidic. This otherwise undeveloped landscape now looks as if an industrial mine has been in operation for decades, and scientists want to know why. Roman Dial, a professor of biology and mathematics at Alaska Pacific University, first noticed the starkest water quality changes while doing field work in the Brooks Range in 2020. He spent a month with a team of six graduate students and they could not find adequate drinking water. There's so many streams that are not just stained. They are so acidic that they curdle your powdered milk. In others, the water was clear, but you could not drink it because it had a really weird mineral taste and tang. Dial, who had spent the last 40 years exploring the Arctic, was gathering data on climate change-driven changes in Alaska's tree line for a project that also includes work from ecologist Patrick Sullivan, director of the Environment and Natural Resource Institute at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and Becky Hewitt, an environmental studies professor at Amherst College. Now the team is digging into the water quality mystery. I feel like I'm a grad student all over again in a lab that I don't know anything about and I'm fascinated by it, Dial said. Most of the rusting waterways are located within some of Alaska's most remote protected lands, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve, the Kobuk Valley National Park, and the Selawak Wildlife Refuge. The phenomenon is visually striking. It seems like something has been broken open or something been exposed in a way that has never been exposed before, Dial said. All the hard rock geologists who look at these pictures, they're like, oh, that looks like acid mine waste. But it's not mine waste. According to the researcher, the rusty coating on rocks and stream banks is coming from the land itself. The prevailing hypothesis is that climate warming is causing underlying permafrost to degrade. Ah. That releases sediment rich in iron, and when those sediments hit running water and open air, they oxidize and turn a deep rusty orange color. The oxidation of minerals in the soil may also be making the water more acidic. The research team is still early in the process of identifying the cause in order to better explain the consequences. Quote, I think the pH issue, the acidity of the water, is truly alarming, end quote, said Hewitt. While pH regulates many biotic and chemical processes in streams and rivers, the exact impacts on the intricate food webs that exist in these waterways are unknown. From fish to stream, bedbugs, and plant communities, the research team is unsure what changes may result. The rusting of Alaska's rivers will also likely have an impact on human communities. Rivers like the Kobik and the Wulik, where rusting has been observed, also serve as drinking water sources for many predominantly Alaskan native communities in northwest Alaska. One major concern, said Sullivan, is how the water quality, if it continues to deteriorate, may affect the species that serve as main sources of food for Alaska's native residents who live subsistent lifestyles. Mm. I'm going to end that there. There is more to the article if you want to read more. But yeah, just fucking up water again although yeah. this time we're still trying to figure out why it's leading like second causal hand cancer. fuck up we did it yeah. in the end we know we did it we yeah. caused it somehow yeah but that's probably depressing enough let's get on with this episode okay from the unexplained to the mundane why don't you come join us on our journey to the fringe Hello and welcome to Journey to the Fringe. We're doing fine, not that you ever really ask. We are your passive-aggressive hosts, Taylor and Chelsea. And today, Chelsea has brought us tales of the rigid hinterlands known as Antarctica, and I will let her take it away. I was inspired by Taylor's moon episode, now a few, two or three or four. That's the last episode. The last episode? Yeah. Here I am letting you know that I'm not constantly doing math, so my mistake. I'm always doing math, so I know exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I decided to do something similar, but a little closer to home. And by a little closer to home, I at least mean in the same atmosphere as all of us. Because I don't know the actual measurements between where I am to Antarctica. We will always be closer to Antarctica than the moon. If we're not, then... (laughs) The planet has either been destroyed or the moon is about to destroy the planet. In which case, the gravity's already wreaked havoc on us. So Antarctic is close in relation to the moon, like really close. Like we don't want the moon that close. I didn't know that. That's right. The continent no one knows has many a mystery about it. And I thought I would delve into some of those mysteries you may or may not have heard of today. 
First up on my list, the entrance to Hollow Earth. The idea of a Hollow Earth was first mentioned in 1818 by John Symes, Sims, Simmies, an American Navy officer. He suggested that the Earth consisted of a hollow shell about 1,300 kilometers, 810 miles, in case you're not in Canada, or anywhere else, in, the, in case you're in the United States. Okay, let's just put it that way, because, yeah thick with openings about 2300 kilometers i'm not doing miles on this one across at both poles four inner shells each open at the poles sims i'm going with sims became the most famous of the early hollow earth proponents and he even has a monument built for him in hamilton ohio is also proposed making an expedition to the north pole hole thanks to efforts of one of the followers james mcbride different person here, Jeremiah Reynolds, also delivered lectures on the hollow earth and argued for an expedition. Reynolds went on an expedition to Antarctica himself, but missed joining the great U.S. exploring expedition of 1838 to 1842. This theory gained traction when apparently a lost diary of Admiral Richard E. Byrd was found that details his encounter with the underground race whilst trying to put a U.S. research base at the South Pole. According to his lost diary, he visited the Pentagon to share news of this new race he had met, but was ordered to keep quiet. We will have more on Bird in a little bit, so stick a mental pin in that, and another pin for the possibly other episode on Hollow Earth, because that was the literal least I could do on the subject without turning this into a long multiple part episode. Yeah, the Admiral Bird stuff's fun. Yeah, and we're going to talk about it. Good. This may or may not be explained by an actual giant hole that periodically appears in Antarctica named entrance to the hollow earth. Just kidding. It's named the giant hole. The latest appearance Wait. was in... Yeah. Why couldn't they just call it the South Pole Hole? <laughs> because that's too fun to say. It is. North Pole Hole North Pole Hole would be so good. Yeah, we didn't want anyone to have that much fun saying hole. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I... I think we just at that point have to assume like souls go in the South Pole hole or the North Pole hole. Yeah. Just due to the rhyming capabilities of that. And troll hole. And then the story writes itself. Yeah. (laughs) The troll hole for the boy soul at the North Pole (laughs) hole. (laughs) Exactly. It was all written into that song. I think the part about the North Pole hole was cut out of that though. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they, they they bleeped it out for boys. Yeah. <laughs> boys hole took precedence. It was over less that. offensive. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The latest appearance was in 2017 of the giant hole. <laughs> One up, uh, Polynia, the official name for a large ice hole with an area of approximately 3,700 square miles. Damn it, I'm all over the place with my measurements. Over the next few weeks, it would increase by size by more than eight times. A Polynia in the same place also appeared in the 1970s before eventually closing. Researchers now believe it was caused by a powerful cyclone passing through, and there is a study published June 10th in the journal Nature. Quote from the journal Nature. We thought this large hole in the sea ice known as Polynia was something that was rare, maybe a process that had gone extinct. The events in 2016 and 2017 forced us to reevaluate that, said lead author Ethan Campbell, a UW doctoral student in oceanography. Observations show that the recent Polynias opened from a combination of factors, one being the unusual ocean conditions, and the other being a series of very intense storms that swirled over the Dell Sea with almost hurricane force winds. Polynia, a Russian word that roughly means hole in the ice, can form near shore as wind pushes the ice around, but it can also appear far from the coast and stick around for weeks to months, where it acts as an oasis for penguins, whales, and seals to pop up and breathe. And I love the word oasis when it comes to those animal lives. God bless them. The biggest known Polynias were at that location in 1974, 75, and 76, just after the first satellites were launched, when the area the size of New Zealand remained ice-free through three consecutive Antarctic winters despite air temperatures far below freezing. The article goes on, NASA satellite image in August 2016 drew public attention to a 33,000 square kilometer gap that appeared for three weeks. 
I like the consistency. <laughs> There's none at all. <laughs> An even bigger gap, 50,000 square kilometers, appeared in September and October in 2017. I'm just waiting until they measure it in acres. <laughs> so that's what's going on with the spontaneous mystery holes, kind of. I mean, we could go with the entrance to Hollow Earth just doesn't want to be covered at all with anything. I mean, this very well could give more evidence towards the hollow earth theory as the opening keeps caving in or something, I don't know. Didn't give it that much thought and with that on to the next conspiracy theory. Which is that Antarctica is guarded by the military. I wouldn't have thought this was falling under conspiracy theory, but here we are with it in my notes. One myth that comes to light in recent years is that Antarctica is guarded by the military. That's brand new information to me. This theory has been supported by photos of military personnel from various countries operating in Antarctica. Oh yeah, they all have their science labs there. I'm just curious, before you get into it, is this pushed forward by the Flat Earth people? You know what? Or is it... I, with all of this, I didn't want it to be a super long episode. I don't know that I touched the Flat Earth. Okay, because that's... We mentioned it last time. The flat earth is, Antarctica is the wall around everything. So in their mind, it's kind of guarded so that nobody's allowed to actually prove that it's the flat earth. Because if you were to actually try to take a ship all the way around Antarctica, if it was a wall, it would take you way longer than you would expect. So you would never find the other ship. So in their mind, it would be guarded to stop people from doing that experiment. I'm glad that you could bring this to this episode about the flat earth. There are multiple reasons the military could be hanging out there if they were. That being one, Ninja. flat earth, because we don't... Ninjen, most importantly, they would want to keep their eye on them. I would want them there for that. There's those two things. And then we'll cover the rest of the reasons that the military might need to be guarding the Antarctic because there's many a reason in this episode that it would be founded in guarding. This theory has been supported by photos of military personnel from various countries operating in Antarctica. Whilst the photos are likely genuine, Antarctica is not guarded. The not guarded is underlined in my notes would be illegal for military activity to take place in the region due to the Antarctic Treaty. This is the agreement between countries that operate in Antarctica that sets the ground rules for the continent. It promotes peace, which is strange for having it also is on Earth, and specifically prohibits any military activity in the region. However, it does allow countries to use military personnel and equipment in the region as long as it's for scientific purposes. For example, the United States uses its Air Force to supply its research base in Antarctica from a supply base in New Zealand. This is why you'll sometimes see photos of military personnel or equipment in Antarctica, not because it's guarded. However, there have been more rumors that some countries have been conducting secret operations in Antarctica. Looking at you, China, always doing secret things. I'm looking at Norway. And I saw them doing that investigation into that crashed alien craft in that documentary in the 80s. Yeah, that's a thing, yeah. too. I'm looking at a lot of countries. And these are low-key and not aimed at guarding Antarctica. FYI, China's Antarctic science program is broad and it has economic activities in the region including fisheries and tourism and has expressed longer term interest in resource extraction. In recent years, China has become an assertive participant in Antarctic governance. For the military effect, kind of, it is also said that Antarctica is a no-fly zone which is not really true. You could fly there, but not sure why you'd want to. It's out of the way to literally any city on Earth, and the conditions are horrible. So there's that. Next up, Antarctica's lost civilization. That's the next conspiracy theory, that there's a lost civilization there. There are claims that Antarctica was once home to a pre-modern civilization that could be the mythical city of Atlantis, or other things, I guess, if you really want it to be. A basis for this claim is, among many things, the ancient Piri Reis map created in 1513, which appears to show the Antarctic continent before it froze over. Conspiracy theorists back up the claim with many... So this is a separate thought, not Piri Reis. Piri Reis is 
I don't know if we'll do that. I don't know if it'd be enough to make an episode. It might. There, we'll we could do future. maps. Um, that's always an interesting one because there's more than just the Puri Reeves map. Yeah. Conspiracy theories back up the claim of lost civilizations being in Antarctica with many Google Earth satellite images, such as this one. This is just the link I have highlighted. I'm not even looking at it at this point. It could potentially make it onto the socials if I'm feeling enthusiastic that day. This, this image that I'm now describing that I'm not looking at is one in which people are describing as a moat and bailey castle. I do recall this, I'm still not looking at it. It's like, it doesn't look like a naturally occurring shape. It looks different, which people find a lot of on Antarctica. I'm gonna be honest with you, they look on Google Maps and find things that look weird. As for hard evidence behind this, we do know that Antarctica was formed when the supercontinent Gondwana broke up. At this time, Antarctica was a tropical forest and could have sustained a civilization. However, Antarctica had diverged from Gondwana, moved to its southern position, and froze over long before humans had even evolved in Africa around two to six million years ago. So the chances of another intelligent life form similar to humans existing prior to this are near impossible, says this article. As for the Moton Bailey castle that I just talked about, they say it's just a frozen lake. So don't listen to people just looking up things on Google Maps. Closely relating to lost civilization is the Hidden Pyramids, which did briefly get brought up in the last episode. Yeah, and that's the next episode, so... <laughs> oh, Ash? <after> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm predicting Look the future you. here. I love a good foreshadowing. Now, there are multiple episodes of Ancient Aliens on this one. Linda Moulton Howe also talks about this one, as well as Richard Hoagland. Perhaps built by an ancient and powerful race and hidden under the ice, every now and then one of them pokes out accidentally and photographs are taken, but by the time anyone looks again, the snow is heaped back over and it disappears from view. Also, some mountains look a bit pyramid-like from some directions if you haven't noticed before. Some say the basis for this claim is this structure found on Google Earth, which it, it is but it basically looks like a snow-covered pyramid sticking out of the ice. The pyramid is located in the southern part of the Ellsworth Mountains, which is an area known for its fossils. There is another pyramid-like structure in the Shackleton Mountain Range in Antarctica, known as the Shackleton Period, among theorists, and is much bigger than the other plainclothes, very obvious pyramids on Earth, such as the Giza Pyramids. David Childress says this about the pyramid. If this gigantic pyramid in Antarctica is an artificial structure, it would probably be the oldest pyramid on the planet and, in fact, might be the master pyramid that all other pyramids on Earth were designed to look like. End quote. Then there is Michael Sala, who argues, but not against Childress, he's agreeing, arguing, that the Antarctic Pyramid is just one node in the global network of power generating pyramids strategically placed around Earth. A popular pyramid conspiracy claims the triangular structures act as power generators of sorts built for the purpose of transiting vast amounts of energy wirelessly. Dr. Salas said there has been extensive research done on pyramids throughout the world in terms of their structure and what it is they really are. He says, one of the theories is that pyramids are power generators, so if you have these pyramids strategically placed around the world generating a charge, it's possible to create a general standing wave around the world that is a wireless transmission of energy. This theory was disregarded specifically by Professor Eric Rignot, who specialized in Earth System Science at the University of California. He told Live Science that it is just a mountain that has experienced many years of erosion, which has caused the steep sides that resemble a pyramid. Now, those are a few of the, I don't know what you call them, less interesting in my opinion <laughs> conspiracy theories about Antarctica running rampant in this world. The next ones I, I really like. These ones I quite enjoy. Next one up on deck is UFO base and UFO crash landings. Could it be numerous alien spacecraft that have had less than successful landings? Various satellite images show suspicious formations and markings that some believe are evidence of extraterrestrial activity. 
Currently, nothing has been proven and skeptics have come up with numerous explanations such as shadows, mountains, abandoned research facilities. I mean, I guess nothing has been proven literally anywhere regarding UFOs, let alone the Antarctic. On the other side of the skeptic claim, I'm going to look to Linda Moulton Howe on this one. For one, interviewed a naval officer, Ryan S., who retired in 97, and he, of course, had to provide his documentation to back up his credentials that I did not list here, of course, because why would I? And, And he served in the Antarctic. This is coming straight from her on an episode of Phenomenon Radio. As always, I love Linda Moulton Howe. She does a good job. Check her out on earthfiles.com or Phenomenon Radio, which I also had no idea she was a part of with Jim Burroughs. Do you remember him? The name sounds familiar. He's one of the guys from Indlesham Forest. Oh, right, right. We're yes. right. They have a Phenomenon Radio show together. Okay, so back to Brian. Brian S. says his C-130 crew whatever that means, no idea, encountered high strangeness while they were flying cargo and doing rescues between 1984 and 1997. During this time, he flew over 300 times around the area. Antarctic. Several times, he and his crew watched silver discs darting around over the sky over the Transantarctic Mountains. They also saw a huge hole in the ice, football field size, 5 to 10 miles. There you go. Acres. <laughs> from the geographic south pole that was supposed to be an air sampling station but in a no-fly zone. During an emergency medevac crisis to speed up their trip, the crew flew across the no-fly zone and saw what they were not supposed to see, which was the entrance to a rumored human and ET science collaboration research base under the ice. Then at a camp near Marie Birdland, some dozen scientists disappeared for two weeks. And when they reappeared, Brian's flight crew got the assignment to pick them up. Brian said they would not talk and their faces looked scared. Brian and his crew received several orders at different times to not talk and were told sternly, you did not see the ice hole, you saw nothing. But he was never asked to sign a non-disclosure. So now he's out talking about it to Linda Moulton Howe. Brian states that talk among the flight crew was that there was a UFO base at the South Pole and there was talk among scientists that extraterrestrial biological entities worked with scientists beneath the air sampling station in the hole in the ice. Now, that in particular is an hour-long episode and gives you the gist, like, really quickly. Uh, She can go on about it for an hour and a half, but (laughs) I cannot. So that's that. Now, Linda Moulton Howe also speaks about naval SEAL and marine whistleblowers, Spartan 1 and 2. Linda had received other confirming whistleblower information about huge, mysterious architecture two to three miles deep under the ice of Antarctica. Since the early 1970s and deep ice penetrating radar investigations, there have been U.S. military operations to explore different, large alien sites hidden from human civilization by all the ice but allegedly still operating with energy, light, and bizarre holographic projections that emerge from some deep tunnel walls. The star maps on some large doors allegedly link the interstellar trade through and beyond the Milky Way galaxy. Just some food for thought here. I like Linda Moulton Howe. She's a solid researcher. She does her research. She vets her whistleblowers. She gets all the documentation. She's one of my favorites. Oh, maybe we have a Linda Moulton Howe episode in the future. She's less of an asshole than anything, though. So we'll see yeah. what kind of... There, eventually, I think we have to do some type, sort of good asshole. guys in the UFO community. And uh, there, you can name quite a few, actually, that we could do episodes on. Yeah. But man, there's a lot of assholes to get through. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but uh, the assholes are just like a lot more entertaining for some yeah. reason. So, I don't think, and you're listening to us on this podcast, we have brains, we're doing math, we, we're we constantly doing math, even if it's counting episodes. I don't think the information we're always necessarily given is going to be the truth, and a little bit of myself dies when we do an episode of a fun theory or a cryptid, and the information always comes up as it can easily be explained away as something or other that is not what we want it to be. Like, I want every Every episode we do, I want it to be what that thing is. <laughs> As I pretty much done earlier in this this very episode with no fly zones, South Pole hole, 
etc etc and we see these mentioned again with linda moulton howe's whistleblower accounts everything i said no there's no military in the antarctic and here they are operating there doing who the hell knows what this is literally information i googled because i can't jump in my private jet to ensure there is not a no-fly zone and the military and aliens aren't conducting experiments in the south pole and as we have seen with various government operations we have covered in our podcast if the military is doing things, they're not always going to be forthright about it. So I'm just going to balance the skeptic out in this episode with the believer in this episode and say, yeah, if Linda Moulton Howe did more research than me, which she sure as hell did, I'm going to think about that a little harder. And yes, I do want there to be an alien underground base in the Antarctic, and it's better than the Nazis. So that brings me to my next topic, which is Nazis in Antarctica. <laughs> They're not on the moon, they're in Antarctica. <laughs> they could be anywhere. <laughs> yeah. This is New Schwabeland, isn't it? Or something like that? Yes. Yeah, it's really all over the place. This is one of my favorite things in the absolute universe. <laughs> this story right here that I'm going to talk about. And this story is probably why I picked this episode to do alone. Because this is good stuff. This one's loaded. It starts with the fact that there was, in fact, a German expedition to Antarctica between 1938 and 39. So, just before the start of the Second World War. Exhibition was on a ship named Schwabenland. However, this trip was not to establish a military base there, but to try and secure future whaling activity. Or so they say. At the time, the German whaling industry was booming and supplied oil, lubricants, and food, as well as essential ingredients for bomb making. Or so they say. Schwabenland was equipped with a steam catapult and two Dornier wall flying boats. I don't know what that means. Which were used to photographically survey 60,000 square kilometers. About a dozen aluminum flags were dropped from the craft at turning points of flight polygons and others were left by foot expeditions. None of these have ever been recovered. Conspiracy theorists have long referred to a quote from Admiral Donitz where he mentions an invulnerable fortress. Quote, an invulnerable fortress, paradise-like oasis in the middle of eternal ice, unquote. However, as pointed out in the journal article, this is likely referring to the Arctic, not Antarctic. Two very different things. Cherry on the cake for those that believe this theory was when the United States sent a large fleet to Antarctica between 1946 and 47 under Operation High Jump, which I'm about to tell you about. The operation was organized by Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, which I briefly mentioned with no, with a little bit of context up above. You had no idea who he was, or maybe you did. High Jump's objectives, according to the U.S. Navy report of the operation, were number one, training personnel and testing equipment in frigid conditions. Number two, consolidating and extended the United States sovereignty over the largest practicable area of the Antarctic continent, publicly denied as a goal before the expedition ended. Number three, determining the feasibility of establishing, maintaining, and utilizing bases in the Antarctic and investigating possible base sites. Number four, developing techniques for establishing, maintaining, and utilizing air bases on ice with particular attention to later applicability of such techniques to operations in interior Greenland where conditions are comparable to those in Antarctic. Number five, amplifying existing stores of knowledge of electromagnetic, geological, geographic, hydrographic, and meteorological propagation conditions in the area. And number six, supplementary objectives of the Nanook expedition, which is a smaller equivalent conduct off eastern Greenland. According to some, this was not the objective at all. Based on a 2006 Russian documentary that was recently translated into English, revealing new information about a U.S. Navy Antarctica expedition in 1946-1947. I did watch this documentary, obviously. There's also the Lost Journal of Richard Byrd, which I talked about earlier. That was my foreshadowing. Gotta do it once or twice or a lot of times per episode, which supposedly makes mention of some of the stuff below. I'm going to talk to you about Operation High Jump now and what it supposedly entailed. 
Originally scheduled for a six-month period, scientific expedition was officially called the United States Navy Antarctic Development Program and given the operational name High Jump. Naval component of Operation High Jump was known as Task Force 68, comprised of 4,700 military personnel, one aircraft carrier, which was the USS Philippine Sea, among the largest of all carriers of the time, and a number of naval support ships and aircraft. The naval expedition was headed by famed polar explorer Admiral Richard Byrd. See all the foreshadowing that I brought you right here? And you're like, right, I know him. He had been ordered to consolidate and extend American sovereignty over the largest practical area of the Antarctic continent. Byrd's expedition ended after only eight weeks with many fatalities according to initial news reports based on interviews with crew members who spoke to the press while passing through Chilean ports. Rather than denying the heavy casualty reports, Admiral Byrd revealed in a press interview that Task Force 68 had encountered a new enemy that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Admiral Byrd's statements were published in the Chilean press, but never publicly confirmed by U.S. authorities. Indeed, Byrd did not speak again to the press about Operation High Jump, leaving it for researchers to speculate for decades over what really happened and why Byrd was silenced. After the Soviet collapse in 1991, the KGB released previously classified files that cast light on the mysterious Byrd-led naval expedition to Antarctica. The documentary made public for the first time in 1947 secret Soviet intelligent report commissioned by Joseph Stalin of Task 68's mission to Antarctica. The intelligence report gathered from Soviet spies embedded in the U.S. revealed that the U.S. Navy had sent the military expedition to find and destroy a hidden Nazi base. You heard it from Joseph Stalin himself. I actually heard it from Tom DeLonge first. <laughs> It's, it's an integral part to his book. <laughs> On the way to the Nazi base, they encountered a mysterious UFO force that attacked the military expedition, destroying several ships and a significant number of planes. Indeed, Operation High Jump had suffered many casualties, as stated in the initial press reports from Chile. They're always on the cutting edge of news. Have you noticed that about Chile? It's it's an interesting place. Yeah. yeah. While there is a possibility the report resulted from U.S. disinformation fed to a known Soviet mole, the more likely explanation is that the report exposes the first known historical incident involving a battle between U.S. naval forces and an unknown UFO force stationed near Antarctica. Obviously, that's just common sense. It is a historical fact that Nazi Germany devoted significant resources to the exploration of Antarctica and established a pre-war presence there with its first mission in the Antarctic summer of 1938-1939. According to a statement by Grand Admiral Donitz in 1943, the German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the fewer in another part of the world a Shangri-La land, an impregnable fortress. If the fortress was in Antarctica, was it built by the Nazis or discovered there? After the defeat of Nazi Germany, according to various sources, elite Nazi scientists and leaders escaped to the impregnable fortress by U-boats, may or may not have been there when they went to Antarctica, two of which experienced difficulties and surrendered in Argentina. And these Nazi scientists, they were so in high demand. They were everywhere. They were everywhere. They went everywhere. Everybody you had wanted to scoop them, them up they when you saw one. Commodity. You couldn't shop around. <laughs> No, oh, you couldn't. If you saw it, you had to take it as is. And some went to Antarctica with the UFOs. And I don't think this is in my notes. There is a lot of stuff with Nazi and the occult that the Nazis had the bell, UFO bell. And I don't believe that was ever... Yeah, Dos Glock or whatever. I don't know if it was ever found. Dos Glock or... Yeah, something like that. I just say it in English and call it the bell because... <laughs> Let's be honest... No, we're, we're pronunciators. Yeah. I'm sorry, I take that We're professional that pronunciators. We're bleeping that out. So did they take the UFO? Like, imagine if they got away with that UFO technology, and maybe they took their best Nazi UFO scientists with them. Then what? We're fucked. The, the Anta and I never want to go to Antarctic. 
In the Soviet intelligence report, never before known testimony by two U.S. Navy servicemen with Operation High Jump was revealed. A recent article in New Dawn by Frank Joseph gives a detailed analysis of the two eyewitness accounts, only the latter of which was mentioned in the 2006 Russian documentary. Two sentence. Sometimes I have to clarify. John P. Sheshwansh. <laughs> Shawatch. A radio man station in the USS Brownson gave testimony of how UFOs appeared dramatically out of the ocean depths. On January 17, 1947, at 700 hours, Shawatch says. Well, this is a quote from him. I and my shipmates in the pilot house port side observed for several minutes the bright lights that ascended about 45 degrees into the sky very quickly. We couldn't ID the lights because our radar was limited to 250 miles in the straight line. In brackets, our real war of the worlds. In bracket. Over the next several weeks, according to the Soviet report, the UFOs flew close over the U.S. naval flotilla, which fired on the UFOs, which did retaliate with deadly effect, according to Lieutenant John I Sayerson. believe a flotilla is just like a pack of warships. Really? Yeah. That sounds like a made-up word, and it reminds me of tortilla. The thing shot vertically out of the water at tremendous velocity, as though pursued by the devil, and flew between the masts of the ship at such high speed that the radio antenna oscillated back and forth in its turbulence. An aircraft from the Karatuk that took off just a few moments later was struck with an unknown type of ray from the object and almost instantly crashed into the sea near our vessel. About 10 miles away, the torpedo boat Maddox burst into flames and began to sink. Having personally witnessed this attack by the object that flew out of the sea, all I can say is it was frightening. That's all I can say about it. So that's the end of the quote from Shawatch. There is a major problem with Sayerson's quote. There had been no torpedo boat named Maddox in the U.S. Navy. In the Russian documentary, the incident described by Sayerson refers instead to the destroyer Murdoch. There was, however, no destroyer named Murdoch active in the U.S. fleet in 1947. Instead, there was a destroyer named Maddox, but it did not serve in Operation High Jump. In fact, USS Maddox was the destroyer fired upon in the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964. According to Frank Joseph, the USS Maddox was either a torpedo boat or torpedo carrying destroyer. It goes on to explain what may have happened to the Maddox mentioned in the Soviet report. Quote, a USS Maddox was indeed sunk by enemy action, but five years earlier by a German dive bomber during the Allied invasion of Sicily. Actually, there are at least three American destroyers known by that name. And then it lists some weird things. DD-168. I don't know what that means. So... Where's that? All of them contemporaneous. The U.S. Navy has long been notorious for falsifying the identity of its ships and rewriting their histories if they embarrass official policy. So too, the Maddox cited by Soviet espionage was similarly consigned to an official memory hole. If Joseph is correct, then it is very possible that uh, USS Maddox was destroyed during Operation High Jump, and the U.S. Navy changed official records to hide this, to being destroyed by Nazi UFOs. An alternative explanation is that in 1947, Soviet report contained U.S. orchestrated disinformation that was being conveyed to Soviet authorities by a Soviet mole known by the U.S. intelligence community. Do you imagine coming up with a lie this elaborate to feed a mole? <laughs> then mean, again, we have Richard Doty. Yeah, and World War II was all about that. Like, they invented an yeah. entire invasion that didn't happen, and they built inflatable fake tanks that they were going to load onto ships. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, a little bit. <laughs> Though plausible, this is highly unlikely given exactly what Taylor just said. Given that the US and USSR were still allies at the time of Operation High Jump and had a common interest in finding and destroying any hidden Nazi bases in the South Atlantic. The destructive technology used by the UFOs in the Soviet intelligence report was not something that had been developed by the defeated Nazis, but only shortly before been tasked to retreat to the South Atlantic. It appears the UFOs were not intended on destroying Task Force 68 by forcing it to turn back. Were the UFOs protecting the retreating Nazis and or their own presence in Antarctica? 
Is the Stalin-era report disinformation deliberately fed to the Soviet authorities by U.S. intelligence? What is the most likely answer that the Soviet-era report released in the 2006 Russian documentary was substantially correct? This suggests that Admiral Byrd's initial press report was accurate. A new enemy that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds had emerged. Most importantly, the UFO force had inflicted heavy casualties on the U.S. Navy that was powerful to oppose it. The world's first known battle between the United States military and an unknown UFO fleet base near Antarctica very likely occurred in 1947 and the general public has never learned about it until now. That's one of my most favorite Antarctica stories that I just thought I'd leave it off with here. That's a good one. I, I like that. And surprisingly, if you want to read a fictionized version of it without spoilers being given, go read Secret Machines by Tom DeLonge. Yeah, I never did get around to reading that. And I love the story. And apparently there's tons of it with Tom DeLonge talking about this. Yeah. Because he also says that he mixes in truth with his stuff. But yeah. it's still... <laughs> It's still made up, which is super weird what he does. And he also doesn't actually write it. He tells yeah. the selling authors to write them for him. <laughs> This is one of my favorite stories because you just think about like Nazis were so into the occult and taking like all this secret knowledge from the libraries in Egypt and working on UFO technology and just imagine if they got that away and kept working on it with scientists and hiding it. On the moon, yeah. Yeah, on the moon in Antarctica, <laughs> there very well could be a hidden Nazi base where they're just like light years ahead of yeah. us in technology. Yeah, it's a fun UFOs. thought experiment. If if you want to see the moon version of it, I recommend the movie Iron Sky. It's a fun watch. Okay, I've never even heard of it. I'll have to. But you will see that I'm biased in this because I just spent most of my time talking about the Nazis in Antarctica. And there are a lot of Antarctic conspiracy theories out there. These are just a few of them. Obviously, I spent most of my time on the Admiral Byrd story about the Nazi UFOs. Who doesn't like saying Nazi UFOs? People who like saying North Pole Hole of course that one's funner to say without a doubt i just forgot about it for did you end up watching any of the admiral bird like old 1950s interviews no they're really interesting to listen to they're on youtube so YouTube are they listens yeah i've definitely listened to that russian documentary but that's definitely not richard bird talking oh, okay giving interviews. because yeah you can actually yeah. see him sit down and talk about like what antarctica was like really yeah, yeah i'll have weird. to do that i have a long list of things that i need to do and only so much time because I'm here regaling everybody with wonderful stories about things on this podcast. With the best words. Some of them, yeah, and some of them I just read. Pronounce so, proficiently. No, without pronouncing, without, no, I would never pronounce it incorrectly for you guys. And reading articles without having read them before it. So that is the quality entertainment that you have and two weapons. Yeah, that's probably a good spot to end this then. Yeah, Antarctica is a fun place. I think the whole idea of us not exploiting the resources on that continent, just kind of agreeing to it, always seems weird to me because we fucked the rest of the world. Why not all of it? I know. That's what I was laughing at earlier when I said it's just kind of like a peace treaty. So peaceful. Nobody can go there. Like, yeah, right. Even corporations. Yeah. Why does everyone think we're so righteous all of a yeah. sudden? We are not. As we can't wait for the northern ice caps to melt so that we can extract the oil from beneath the surface and have Everything a war that over we that. And we will be after. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, that's probably a good spot to end off. Chelsea, thank you for this delightful romp down in the warmer climate of Antarctica right now, technically. For we are in winter. Yes. Heat wave. Yes. And climate change. So it's and probably hotter change. than ever. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I have been Taylor here with Chelsea. We are Journey to the Fringe. Thank you all for listening, and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to Journey to the Fringe. If you have liked what you have listened to, please like, share, subscribe, or follow, depending on what 
venue you are listening to us through. Also, please, if possible, leave a five-star review as that really helps us in the algorithms. Should you wish to interact with us, please check us out on your social media of choice. I bet you we are there. And if you really want to communicate with us and give us ideas for new episodes or tell us that we're wrong and terrible, either way, please send us an email at journeytothefringe at gmail.com. For now, I'll see you in the next episode. Uh